Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge. In this session, we welcome Dr. Elizabeth Castello for a presentation and discussion about mobilizing social capital through social accounting. Elizabeth is an assistant professor of organizational leadership in the College of Integrative Sciences and Arts at Arizona State University. Her research explores pro-social organizing and resource exchange to create an economy that works for everyone. She is a 2020 recipient of the Aspen Institute's Ideas Worth Teaching Award, a, go a global prize for innovation that transforms business education. Her scholarship is informed by ecology and evolutionary principles like mutualism, energy flows across food webs and cultural evolution with the goal of developing theories, practices and policies that promote equity, inclusion, anti-fragility and open-mindedness in organizations and society. So welcome Elizabeth and over to you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining. Um, it's great to be with Kindred Spirits here. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, uh, I come from a background of 30 years of practice, um, a latecomer to academia, and uh, I'm going to be talking about how the, this social accounting can blend these two practices. So there's uh, less of a divide. Um, and the interest for this really came around with, um, in these presentations in the previous times, there's a, a, a such a yearning for social capital to be developed, but you know, why isn't it, if it's so important and people like us understand why it's important, why isn't it getting taken up in the world more earnestly? Um, and so this presentation is really a, a, an answer to that, a, 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 to commune people together. And as I see the problem, uh, that I came across this in the sustainability literature, and that is for a resource to be mobilized, you first have to recognize that it's a resource and integrate it into your knowledge system. And the example that was used was the petroleum industry and how even though indigenous societies had recognized this as a resource for a while, in the United States, it wasn't until the 1800s where in Pennsylvania, where these tar pools were discovered and somebody uh, realized it could become a fuel source. And that really was the launch of the petrochemical industry in the United States. And so um, what I argue is that uh, financial accounting has, uh, it's a global knowledge system that has made us blind to social capital. So for you know, thousands of years previous, it, social capital was very um, fundamental to uh, well-being and community operations. But as financial capital uh, and ac accounting took over, social accounting or social uh, capital and relationships really kind of took became this invisible thing that people just took for granted. Um, and so what is the remedy then if, if we have this um, knowledge system that's not serving us anymore? Um, the social accounting offers a model. This is a um, up and coming way of looking at resources that provides a more integrative view. And it combines a financial measure. So you're not giving up the financial aspects of accounting, but you are adding other measures, uh, both quantitative, such as greenhouse gas emissions and qualitative measures um, to understand flows across time often. And so these have a more story-like uh, uh, qualitative nature to them. And so there are journals and such that are devoted to the practice of social accounting and the theorizing of social accounting. Um, Generally, um, the term social accounting isn't used too much in, in the practice and business operations, um, but what are used are terms like corporate social responsibility, um, ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance, uh, sustainability reporting, uh, the triple bottom line, which is people, profit, planet, and then um, social audits. And these are all important and valuable concepts. Um, the problem is that without rigorous measures to undergird them, it's very easy to, to uh, engage in what's called greenwashing, where you talk a good game about sustainability and social capital, but your, your practices are not aligned with that. Um, and so social accounting is a way to overcome this greenwashing effect. 
Um, from the investor rating side, the ESG, so this is where uh, a lot of financial capital on the markets and Wall Street are going towards, is looking at ratings, um, where they're trying to have a, a broader understanding uh, of a company's uh, potential for future earnings. Uh, the problem with these ESG profiles is that they're often focused on risk. Um, and so averting risk that a company might be exposed to, not so much for developing social capital and certainly not human flourishing or collective well-being. Um, so some of the social accounting approaches that are commonly used to overcome these types of challenges are the uh, Global Reporting Initiative, GRI. And so this is probably the most widely adopted um, out of the largest 250 firms worldwide, 93% report on sustainability and 80% of these use GRI standards um, to talk about their impacts. And increasingly, they're linking them to the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And here's an example of how some of those GRI metrics connect to uh, the SDGs. Another framework that is um, in, uh, commonly used is called the uh, SASB Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. And this is a reporting tool that identifies, manages, and communicates financially material sustainability information to investors. And here again, it's taking a little bit more limited view of what counts um, because it has to have a, a financially relevant rationale to be included in the assessment. Um, but the strength of the SASB is that they've developed industry specific measures. So if you're in the mining industry, there's a set of standards you could look at. If you're in the educational um, sector, there's uh, um, standards and metrics that you can look at. And the goal of these types of G both the GRI and the SASB are to promote comparability through standardization so that an investor can compare apples with apples instead of um, having non-standardized metrics. Um, the problem here again though is even that with the standardization, that doesn't mean the metrics are always logical for the company um, and they can't easily be contextualized. Um, so an antidote to that that's used for management practice is the balanced scorecard. And this is a management tool that communicates uh, what a firm wants to accomplish, so its goals, and it connects that to its strategy and four dimensions of what it would take to be successful. So this is a customer orientation, understanding what the customer wants and needs. It's internal processes and operations that support the conversion of uh, resource inputs into outputs, outcomes, and impact. The financial metrics that ensure cash flow and ongoing viability. And then um, an interesting thing is it does have a component for learning and growth. So how does the organization remain responsive to its ever-changing operating environment and um, uh, re retain its, uh, its adaptive capacity? And often this is through processes like organizational learning, creating a culture of learning. Um, and then I'll, I'll say my, uh, my favorite uh, of the social accounting approaches is integrated reporting. Um, and this comes from the International Integrated Reporting Council, which is now part of the Value Reporting Foundation. And it, it um, originated in South Africa. Um, and it's now a required uh, accounting framework for any market listed um, firm there. Um, it's increasingly being used in um, the United Kingdom, in Japan, Australia, um, but sadly not in the United States. So that's what I and some colleagues are trying to change. But it's a, what I like about it are a few things. One, that it's grounded in integrated thinking. So uh, we'll, I'll talk about that on the next slide, but promoting a more holistic view of the firm over short, medium, and long-term time horizons in a way that um, engages stakeholders and connects the organization to its external operating environment. Um, and so it uses this, um, what's called I, an octopus model, and it shows how the resource inputs of different types of capital, financial, manufactured, intellectual, human, social, and natural are transformed through business operations and governance 
um, to become outputs, outcomes, and impacts. And if the firm does it strategically, the outputs and outcomes cycle back to become new inputs into the system. So it creates a circular economy within the organization embedded within a circular economy within society. And that's what I like about it is the circularity, the regenerative potential. So integrated thinking is um, understanding and enhancing um, the external operating environment, um, engaging with stakeholders. So it's not just an organization trying to control its operating environment and imposing externalities without consequences onto the external environment. And then also keeping in mind the long-term um, consequences. Um, so designing for its values and aspirations and um, to ensure intergenerational equity so that the well-being of future generations are also considered. And it does this by aligning values, vision, mission, strategy, objectives, and then the behaviors, actions, and key performance indicators. And uh, while there are different uh, measures and different um, definitions uh, that one of the frameworks that the IIRC uses, um, here, here are some definitions and I just for three of them, the human capital, the social and relational capital, which I know is of primary interest to this group, and then natural capital. Um, one of the big uh, surprises of, of my students sometimes is that humans are part of nature, right? And, and somehow that gets lost. And so this multiple capital model uh, provides this integrative understanding to show how the different types of resources are connected. Um, the other thing I like about the integrated reporting framework is that it there again, it looks at time horizon value, uh, uh, value creation over multiple time horizons. So the balance sheet, the immediate financial is next quarter's earnings or this year's earnings. It's a book value kind of present day. Um, the business value by having this multiple capitals uh, view, you get more ability to forecast and what are the future earnings prospects of the company. Um, and then by also accounting for the societal value through these other intangible metrics like um, social capital, you're able to look at um, the sustained and future viability of the organization, recognizing its embeddedness within its operating context. So, um, you know, the, un the uh, thesis is that basically a firm can only be to successful to the extent that it, the civil society in which it's embedded is successful. And so this is a framework to look at all three of these and, and, and integrate them through the multiple capitals approach. And then it scrolls down to what are the drivers then for each of those dimensions. So for example, brand, uh, reputation, trust um, among customers uh, being one example in the social uh, capital domain. And um, so for my call to action, I, that's really, uh, even though I am a scholar and I understand the importance of uh, neutrality and research, I do have a design point of view, and that is to, you know, create a more social, a pro-social world. And I, uh, even though I came from the nonprofit sector, I really see business as being the, the key lever to make this transition. Um, and so for business leaders, I see the opportunity is to develop pro-social business models through the strategic development of social capital. And as an example of how that can be done, um, I point to Ryan Raphael's Rally's, um, research. He's from Harvard, and he did um, a study of how did independent bookstores reinvent themselves in the face of disruption by Amazon. And what he found, what he calls them the three C's, um, convening, um, com community, building community and curating um, content for customers, um, which are all, you know, uh, dimensions of like social capital and also intellectual capital. But by attending to these um, intangibles um, and, and building community, he, they were able to differentiate themselves from Amazon in a way that they um, didn't have to worry about price points anymore, right? Because the customers were coming not because of the lowest price, but because they were getting something much more valuable, um, which is connecting with other people, um, 
And so they were able to develop a sustainable business model around um, by integrating social capital into their um, processes. And um, so as much as I love integrated reporting, and here we're back to the octopus model here, a lot of the talk about integrated reporting is focused on the right-hand side. So the outputs and outcomes, the things that investors um, are interested in. And what I see as the real opportunity for the coming decade is to focus on the input side of it. So how can um, social capital, for example, be developed endogenously so that it, um, you know, becomes part of the business operations. Um, and really the key to this, I think, is building business models built on mutual benefit, reciprocity, and value co-creation rather than value extraction. And if I had to hypothesize why integrated reporting has not been taken up in the United States more, I think it's because it makes clear who is making money through value extraction and who is making money through value creation. And a lot of the financial markets um, in the US are based on value extraction. And so social accounting is a way to make this more transparent and um, the revert people back to pro-sociality, which is really what um, Adam Smith's original um, version, you know, the moral sentiments of capitalism, the wealth of nations. It wasn't just about free markets at all costs. It was within, freedom within limits, um, which is morality. Um, so another call to act, uh, action from to business leaders is um, one of the reasons that um, social accounting, I think, is struggling is because they have not drawn from all the knowledge that academics have about how to measure and assess these various forms of resources. And so there are, you know, fairly robust measures or at least proxies, as we've talked about for social capital, for how you can, you know, strategically measure these in a way that can be much more um, robust and meaningful than some of the flunky measures that I see being talked about in integrated reports um, and other types of social accounting. Um, and so academics uh, have a lot to offer and I would encourage more of a bridge between practice and um, the academy. Um, the other thing I think that's um, really missing in, in our understanding is how the economy works, and that's the role of endogenous resource creation. Um, the, the mental model that is commonly talked about with the economy is that resources trickle down, right? And that people will do well to the extent that business does well. Um, and so what my research, this is a slide from my uh, dissertation, I studied a group of arts and culture collaborative in uh, San Diego, California. And I found how they were able to mobilize um, the latent um, social capital because there was spatial proximity of these organizations, but until there was a crisis, none of them really talked to each other. So then around 1999, there was a crisis where the city wanted to take funding away. All of a sudden, the social capital started to manifest right through intentional interactions by the executive directors. From that, they formed this uh, cooperative uh, collaborative collaboration called the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership. Through that and their programs, they were able to develop social capital, intellectual capital, natural capital, creative and spiritual capital. And once they had those um, pieces in place, then political capital, reputational capital, and new cultural norms and organizational forms emerged. Um, the point being that you could never have gotten to the political, reputational, and cultural without the intermediary capital development, such as social capital and intellectual capital. Um, and then once you had the political and the reputational uh, properties emerge, they were able to get to long-term financial sustainability by developing a new shared business revenue model. And so they're over a 15-year span, they're um, operating budget went from basically two hundred thousand dollars to you know over five million dollars a year in a with a sustainable source. Um, here again, showing the circular nature of how some of those um, returns cycled back to become new inputs, so the organization could sustain itself while producing public benefit and public value for its member organizations and for people in the community. 
Um, another call to action is to connect the capitals across levels. So while I really do like the integrated reporting uh, framework, what uh, a criticism I have is that it only looks still at the organization. Sometimes it'll talk about it in to connection to the SDGs, but the missing link is to connect it to individuals. So how could the, this uh, multiple capitals be used to for employee well-being assessments, for example? Um, and then uh, to the community. So uh, what are the community well-being indicators? Um, right now, throughout the world, communities are you know, trying to develop these, but they're done in a very, I don't want to say haphazard, but they're a localized way. And so um, there's no way to connect the communicators in, in given um, communities. And by this integrated reporting multiple capitals model offers a way, kind of a fractal model, where it is translatable across different levels and across ge different geographic domains. Um, and so some of the examples where it's, it's being um, used or at least considered, one is New Zealand where the treasury is looking at, uh, so Tristan may be able to tell us more about this, but um, you know, looking at a multiple capitals model as a well-being indicators framework. Um, and then another, it's being used a lot in disaster recovery and resilience um, and disaster preparedness is um, where I've been able to find it in the literature. And there it's called community capitals. Um, so that's a body of literature to draw on. And locally here in um, Phoenix, I and some of my colleagues are working on um, an area a, to develop a dashboard that would have multiple capitals. This was just a toy model that we developed um, drawing from census data because that gathering data can be one of the onerous pieces of social um, accounting and integrated reporting. So if you can find existing data sources, um, it, it makes everybody's life a lot easier. And then it also promotes comparability across um, uh, geographic regions. And I think what differentiates ours is we also use this as a way to look at equity. Um, so resource investments across the Phoenix metro region, we were able to compare this underserved area, Maryvale, with the greater Phoenix area to show you know, where were some of the disparities and then also the strengths um, because Maryvale was, high, uh, was pretty high in um, human capital. Um, and then another call to action, I think everybody in this presentation, it's you know on us to start trying to get this type of social accounting taken up in our own organizations. And so I've been working a lot, um, trying to get it taken up at Arizona State. And this is just a model, an octopus model I developed. Um, I think it is a way to tell the value creation story of higher education in a much more compelling way. Um, if you've read the reports, um, like from Pew um, Charitable Trust, the, the public support of higher education is waning. Um, there's, a, there's more distrusted in institutions in general, but um, you know, uh, state governments have really started under investing in higher education. And it's because so often we just tell our story in numbers, like how many graduates did we have? How many uh, courses did we offer? But what difference did those make? And so integrated reporting offers a cohesive framework to tell the value creation story, to show how you know, the organizational actions benefit individuals, the students, for example, but also um, society at large, um, such as you know, innovation, um, workforce preparedness, and um, civic engagement that creates a stronger ta tax base and more parent involvement. Um, and then to my academic friends, I, I think the onus is also on us to try to change practice within our organizations as far as what counts. Um, because when I look to see why aren't more academics engaged in with business to try to get our knowledge applied in their realm, like um, for example, social capital measures. Our systems do not incentivize us. So for um, you know, professors on the tenure track, if you write a publication just uh, for a community publication, that's not going to advance your career because it's not um, you know, fancy enough. They, the, the metric is um, peer reviewed journals, right? That's, and, and so there's a big disconnect between what's incentivized and what is needed. 
And so I call on um, academics to get involved with networks like this and also the impact scholar community uh, to try to change practices about what counts and what is valued in organizations. Um, so the key takeaways I have uh, are that social accounting is a way to make social capital visible and actionable, and that global frameworks exist to assess and integrate business models and reporting. And social capital in particular, as I'm often asked, which is the most important capital? Of course, human capital, natural capital, but social capital is one that is very actionable. Um, and so, uh, you know, focusing on that as a way to leverage, but also recognize the dependencies on the other capital, such as human, natural, instructional, is a way to produce sustainable value creation and create the world we want um, as envisioned by the sustainable development goals. Um, and my closing message, um, and this is why I wanted to talk to this group, and because the, the um, understanding of social capital is very important, but without the broader integrative understanding of how it connects, we, re, we still, to the others um, and our future aspirations and how we understand ourselves, we risk a very reductionist, um, uh, you know, linear approach, which is not going to get us to where we want to be. And so the, the quote I love here by Rumi, you think because you understand one, that you always that you also understand two, because one and one make two, but you must also understand and. Um, and the value of integrated reporting is that it helps you understand the and. So and I've, I've left some resources that you can look into more things if you're interested. Um, an overview of the sustainability reporting landscape. If we have time, I get to that. Um, and then just look forward to keeping the conversation going um, here and in the future. So thank you. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. All of this around social accounting, it, it feels a lot like we're, we're pushing hard to try and get businesses and governments and people to understand the, the importance and priorities of these kinds of things. And it, it feels a lot like the environmental movement that's been going on for the last 50 or 60 years that's been pushing and pushing and pushing and, and demonstrating the, the benefit and the importance and, the, and all of the scientific understanding of the processes involved and what will happen if we don't do this. And, and yet it's still very slow to, to develop any kind of uptake in it. And so I often wonder and question what we can actually do to encourage uh, not only businesses and, and organizations, but also government to take this up and to, to provide mechanisms to change the, the, the rules of the game, if you like. You know, like the, the economy as it's currently structured doesn't incentivize taking social action, uh, being pro-social. Um, you know, as, as you, I think you've, you've talked about it, it, it really prioritizes and rewards the more extractive kinds of, of approaches. And, and so the question then is, is how can we modify the rules of the game? Um, what sort of role can government take in changing those rules to, to change the incentive structure, to perhaps um, make it possible for us to to, to further these kinds of pro-social ideas that we understand very well. Like I think you've demonstrated that we understand this very, very well. We understand the value and yet it still isn't really being taken up extensively by business and government. Um, yeah, I guess uh, what I'm very disappointed in the role of government and I don't see them being the solution. They, they, they'll come into it, but um, where I, the promise that I see, and this is why I have gravitated more towards business. So for example, the Securities and Exchange Commission, they are getting ready to adopt some human capital measures. Right, so that there has to be reporting requirements um, in the, the filings. And so I think it's those kind of compliance driven within an industry or within a, a domain such as business that are going to help um, you know, the government come on board. Um, but because of things like regulatory capture, where um, there's so much, um, you know, bought influence in the political process, um, at least in the United States, um, government is pretty slow to respond between that and the narrative of, you know, government being kind of a, a thing that keeps you down um, re versus recognizing it's, it's the supportive uh, uh, thing it 
uh, plays. So I, I, I'm really looking to business. And I think also um, organizations like B Corps that are trying to, you know, renormalize uh, what is required for sustainable value creation um, are going to play a big part as well. And then, uh, of course, not to waste a good pandemic, right, or the climate crisis. Finally, you know, the universe will push back or nature will push back when we, when we tr exceed the boundaries and limits, right? And so we're at, the, at those limits right now. Um, you know, for me, the key question is, are we an intelligent enough species to learn to work cooperatively in ways that attune ourselves to nature versus, you know, in um, like a greedy homo economicus model where we've been extracting from nature, which is not as sustainable. And, and I think, you know, the business tide is starting to, to realize if you want a sustainable business, you want sustainable investments, the pro-social model is the way to go. And evolutionary science actually supports this as well. And so it could be that these things like the pandemic and, and climate change and these kinds of things might provide the incentive and motivation for there to be more of this kind of change. But one of the biggest challenges I see is that the values that underpin the current system, the more extractive kinds of kind of system, exploitive system, have, have been developed over the last 200 years. You know, if you look back at the way in which economic theorizing changed in the mid 1800s, we're talking about nearly 200 years ago, it geared us towards shifting our attention towards individual gains and competition and, 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 and self-interest, basically. And so we have this enormous um, reserve of values that exist within our society, ways of doing things, procedures, you know, all of these things need to change. And I, I see this as being the biggest challenge that we have moving forward is, is, is trying to remove all of that, that way of thinking, all of those systems and understandings of the way the world is and try and replace them with what we're talking about today, you know, different ways of thinking about creating value. So I haven't really asked you a question there, but do you have any comment about that? I sure do, um, because then you can build on it besides the 1800s transitions, right? Also the 1980s, right? With Milton Friedman and the purpose of a firm is to maximize shareholder wealth. And that really, you know, and then Reagan took it up with government, you know, as, and for more of a free market and with this neoliberal. And so it was a, a, a perfect storm, um, which really uh, uh, people were fed this trickle down economics. And, and so by understanding the economy in, a, in broad, terms, what are the dimensions that are needed? So social um, relationships, trust, cooperation, those are really what an economy are, is rooted into. So how do we make those visible? And to your point, Tristan, how do we create a narrative around that? So I know people in evolutionary economics are working on this problem. Um, but here again, there's a big divide between what academia writes in its fancy journals versus, you know, the, the public conversation. And so creating narratives and, and phrases um, so that it can help people reorient themselves to what is valuable. And so in the community capitals literature, they use a phrase called spiraling up to show how investments you know, in social capital um, can create this um, cascade effect of increasing returns in ways that um, create larger systemic benefits. Um, very similar to you know, how um, in an ecosystem, species interact to create larger systemic benefits. So I, I think it's, um, you know, finding these new narratives that are um, catchy. Absolutely. And I think that's something that all academics probably need to put some effort into creating that kind of language, creating those narratives that can hopefully be picked up and understood by the wider population. You know, concepts like social capital are very difficult to understand and they don't provide a strong narrative unless we explain them in ways that help people to understand. So we'll have questions from the audience. Um, feel free to raise your hand within Zoom if you would like to. That's under the reactions tab down the bottom. You can put up your hand or you can post something into the chat. Um, Billy Wason, did you want to contribute? Yeah, Elizabeth, thank you. This is a wonderful presentation. Uh, being among the ancients, the heyday of social capital calculations in a crude manner was the 1960s in the federal government. And that was a pioneering effort that uh, uh, our, you know, our, our, our tools were very crude, not the kind of sophisticated presentation that you have. And of course, we 
learned so much about organizations uh, since that time, uh, maybe new approaches. Uh, what it came up against then was a, a question that was raised earlier in the chat. Uh, interests are grounded in values. And so when, you, when the political interests start expressing themselves, it becomes difficult to... Uh, but I'm encouraged now in the economics profession. Uh, 10 years ago, you couldn't find anyone that would admit to the fact that you, there was anything other than you know, uh, hard numbers, if you will, whatever that means. And now we have things like the new, you know, uh, you know, the new economics, the, the Institute for New Economics. You have the Paul Krugmans and the Joseph Stiglitzes, who are begin, who are opening that whole area up, and maybe that also could be a contributor to the narrative. Uh, you couldn't find those folks fifteen years ago in economics departments; they just were not there, or they were they were hidden. You know, they didn't dare speak up, or they wouldn't get tenure. But that's been just a wonderful development. And there's some beautiful work going on, Moiker's work and stuff like that. Fantastic work. So thank you for your yeah. contribution here. Thank you. Oh, Billy, thank you so much. It really makes my heart saying yes that you are on a positive note. It is on the upswing. Daniel Kahneman and behavioral economics, right? That was another huge shift. And then um, I'm okay. a big fan of Kate Rayworth, right? With her oh, donut yeah. economics. Yeah. And yeah. so if any, like she's sort of a model for me about, you know, how can you talk about these fancy things in very plain language? Um, and I think the visualization of it is also what's helped make her, yes. her work so effective. So so uh, learning how to visualize our models um, in in fun and engaging ways. And the thing now, we have a lot more sophisticated measurement mechanisms, even in qualitative analysis area, where you really have much more tools to measure different dimensions of social capital. It's no longer simply lifetime earnings, discounted lifetime earnings, but rather much more you know, attitudinal as, be, as well as behavioral. So that's really a, a big help too. Um, Billy, that, you raise a great point, the methods, right, and how they're evolving. Um, I think computational science is also going to be something really important, right? So what are the interaction effects among these various capitals over time and multiple levels? That's yep. something that isn't really possible to explore, you know, empirically, but computationally it is it, through like agent-based models, you can explore these kind of um, phase space, you know, what is the realm. Um, another thing I really think students need to be taught is complexity science. So what are principles yes. like self-organization and emergence? And um, we don't teach those at our school systems thinking. Um, I introduce them to my students a little bit and most of them have never heard of these things. So I think changing, you know, the educational, what the, the type of science that our um, models are grounded in is going to be important as well. Well, that's good, yeah. Absolutely, and it certainly is encouraging to see the sorts of changes that are occurring within economics as a discipline, as an academic discipline. Um, and reading the commentary from, from different people about those sorts of changes, I think does, does give us some hope that there, there are some really big shifts and, and changes occurring that could, could be very bit beneficial for understanding these kinds of social processes. So we've got a couple of questions in the chat. As I mentioned, if you if you want to put your hand up within Zoom, feel free to do so, or you can post questions in the chat. Elizabeth, we must remember to talk about the New Zealand um, living capital, living standards framework before we finish, but we'll, we'll get to some other questions first. Um, Mike, you have a couple of questions in the chat. Did you want to ask any of those or, or, or talk to them? Well, after posting the initial one, Tristan, I wasn't sure that it was all that relevant. It, I, I too appreciated Elizabeth's model for integrative thinking. Uh, and I, I just wondered how in the world would you ever reconcile? How would you ever get anything done with those kinds of consist, uh, conflicting differences? But I think I answered my own question. Well, how do we get anything done ever with conflicting differences? Um, either there's a will to do so or there isn't. But if Elizabeth wants to say anything about that, uh, please do. Um, yeah, I think that's where the, the, these, these frameworks come in very handy, right? Because it is a way to take all this complexity that firms and people have to deal with and make them more bite-sized and actionable, right? Is to understand the the the, the as resources, uh, that can be helpful. I use uh, that term just because people are very interested in resources. Everybody wants a resource. And so, um, you know, framing um, social capital as a resource that can be developed and drawn upon. Um, but 
the integrated framework, I think, is the best in at showing the circular nature. And I think that's a way to rebuild understanding or reshape a public understanding of how the economy works. And I, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for expounding on it. Uh, it just it, it hit me so quickly that I thought, whoa, what was that? <laughs> and so that that's it. Thank you. So it may in some ways be almost a case of, of changing those, those values and priorities of people um, so that they align more with the, sort of the pro-social um, way of thinking. Uh, because really, if we, can, if we can see and demonstrate to people how um, the extractive, exploitive ways of creating value aren't ultimately very effective, or certainly not on a, on a societal community level, long-term level, uh, then we might start to align more of the interests anyway and, and have less people who are trying to be exploitive um, and extractive in the way in which they're creating value, which, which may also help. And I think Elizabeth's point a moment ago about creating bite-sized chunks, if those chunks are, are indeed uh, appropriately fitting, then the model will work. So it's, it's a matter of, of getting the right fit. And uh, to that point, John, uh, you know, one of the criticisms is that we aren't able to measure everything, you know, right away. And so for people that are very oriented on just specificity and, and th thing, I think that's a prejudice that we have to overcome. And I, 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 sh I share the example of it being um, like the discovery of gases, right? If you've ever looked at the, how the third state of matter was discovered, they didn't discover it by measuring it. What they discovered it was like looking at the interaction effects, so pressure and temperature. If you change one variable, what does it do to that variable? And by understanding the interaction effects, then they got to measurement. And so for intangible assets, I feel we're very much in that parallel um, universe of look, at, you know, we're just starting to understand qualitatively what are these interaction effects. And if we do that enough and experiment with different ways and organizations, we will get to the measurement part. But to insist on the measurement part now is really going to keep us from getting to our goals and aspirations and values. Agree and understand, I do. Well said, well said. Uh, Marion, you've got a couple of questions. Would you like to ask yours? I could talk to Elizabeth all day and I'm hoping to work closely with you for uh, a very long time. Um, Elizabeth, I, um, I see the, uh, there's not an answer, as a business person, I want an answer, but there's no, uh, no answer because of the complexity of it. The first thing that came to my mind was that what we're really talking about here is a change in strategic uh, thinking that occurs within organisations. So that's that's where my I'm actually looking at Bordier and the dispositions of um, of directors in the decision and and part of that is the decision making process. And so from my perspective, a change in you know or challenging the the, the dominant strategic thinking models to incorporate you know a lot of what we're actually sort of talking about here. Um, is it readily available within um, the, the business context? I'm hoping that your university will actually uh, take the run on this. But my question was, isn't this really all about changing of strategic thinking um, to include all of this, all of these issues, etc.? Yes. Absolutely. And then the approaches, the toxic approaches that come from strategic thinking. So a lot of um, business strategy literature is about controlling your operating environment, right? You do that either through mergers and acquisitions, as an example, um, regulatory capture, lobbying. Um, and so, you know, you're trying to impose your will onto the operating environment, often to the detriment of people outside the environment or outside your organization. Um, and so that's where this whole notion of externalities, um, you know, comes up. It's like, um, but the, to, 
what I like about integrated reporting is to get to more of a share, a stakeholder orientation instead of a shareholder realizing, you know, and mm. you have to create solutions that work for everybody. And if you do that, it will work for you too. Um, just like we're discovering with universal design, right? We thought we were helping one group of people, but it really made it better for everybody. Um, and so a pro-social business model is very much the same way. And what's required though is um, to rein in the greed because it does take a little bit longer. I mean, you're going to make money longer over time through the sustainable nature of it, but you won't be maximizing um, next quarter's earnings. And so it's a way to think about optimizing earnings rather than maximizing earnings. Uh, because yeah. ultimately, if you try to maximize all the time, that will fizzle out over time. Um, the other thing I think is um, thinking more of emergent strategy, because so often these opportunities are created, you can't predict them. Um, but if you set, you, if you develop capabilities, then opportunities will arise. And who's done some really great work um, on this in the entrepreneurship space is Sarah Vathi on effectuation. And so she studied how do entrepreneurs, you know, um, create um, valuable businesses. And it was through like who they knew and what they knew, which then created opportunities that emerged. They could not be predicted. And so rethinking, you know, what, how we conceptualize strategy, I think is really key, Marian. Yeah, uh, I think moving it into this, the strategic um, space is probably where the answer is, because I actually teach strategy and I've, I taught the um, balanced scorecard via a Harvard simulation. Um, and if we can look at developing perhaps something of a similar nature that can be used in uh, the education or the, the, the process of strategic thinking and, and teaching strategic thinking um, that includes social capital in the longer term, I think we're looking further, much, much further down the track. Um, but that actually will lead to a shift because that's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing mainly commercial thinking being moved into not-for-profit and not vice versa So, um, in, in what I'm actually sort of doing. So I think we have a very long job ahead, but I think we need to also get a conversation going in the strategic literature as well, which is hopefully going to come out of your university. I'll get on that. <laughs> we'll talk we, about that. Yeah. We, we quite often see that that everything about social capital and everything that we're talking about today, like these are things that organisations do care about, but they're often not strategic about them. They're not deliberate about them. I had someone recently ask me, um, they, they found social capital, they're really interested in it, and they asked me, um, do any businesses actually care about this? Social capital, that is. And I said, yeah, of course they do. They might not use the term social capital. They might not be particularly purposeful about the way in which they manage these kinds of issues, but absolutely they care about it. And they, they're currently doing so via a variety of other concepts or terms or ways of thinking about these things, you know, human resource management, organizational culture, um, you know, well-being. Like there's so many different ways we're thinking about this, but we don't a lot of businesses don't have the kind of framework to be able to understand it and the kind of system like the social accounting kinds of systems in order to, to be more strategic about these kinds of things. But businesses do absolutely, I think, I think care about these things very deeply. Mm. Well, they have to, because uh, to, to have a business, it, you do have to have cooperation, right? You can't have conflict all the time within your organization. Um, so employee engagement and culture, as you said, being two markers of it, um, but they don't use this, this language. And so, you know, creating systems where cooperation is valued both externally and internally, I think is a, a key. Yeah, and I I think we see the same thing with individuals as well, that, that individual people, they do care a great deal about basically social capital for themselves you know, on an individual level, but they're often, they're not particularly conscious of it. They're sort of in the mindset of being competitive rather than cooperative. And so when individuals typically start to think about social capital, 
there starts to be a realignment of their value system where they start to actually align their actions with their values because they're more consciously aware of the importance of social relationships. You know, they're, they're less likely to betray trust. They're more likely to be sharing and giving and build solidarity just simply because they're able to con more consciously align their actions with their values. And I think the same thing is, is a massive opportunity within all organisations to do similar sorts of things. I'd really like us to see uh, the world start using cooperative advantage instead of competitive advantage, right? Because that's what will be this. Uh, to me, the three tensions are peace, prosperity, and progress. And if you do it you know, cooperative advantage, you can get to all three, right? Because a firm builds cooperative surplus. Um, so I love the way you said that, Tristan. I think the closest way that the closest they're getting to is looking at the concept of network strategy. Um, and also open strategy is bringing the stakeholders in, but it's a long way off um, and it'll be great and be very good, exciting to work on all of this with you, Elizabeth. <laughs> and networked governance, I think, is a, a piece, and that's what you're interested, Marianne, I think, in that as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Let's move but, on to, to the next yeah. question, uh, which I think is from Lisa. Do you, do you want to ask your question? Um, Lisa, are you still here? You want to ask your question? Oh, yes, I am still here. I'm sorry. I'm juggling a couple things here and sneaking in this workshop because sure. I was so excited to join. So, yes, my question is to you, Dr. Castillo. It's so great to join you here today. And when we think about discussing integrative reporting um, and the impact of social capital as key decision makers, I'm wondering about how, um, if you've found any differences in comprehension among different generations or education backgrounds. I know one of the other speakers was discussing about, you know, how formal, how can we share this in a more, um, you know, common lingo perspective? That's such a great question, Lisa. I um, really haven't thought about the intergeneration uh, differences until you just asked it. But um, what is heartening to me is seeing how the millennial and younger people are demanding purpose-based vocations and occupations, right? They don't want to just um, go make money as much anymore. It has to be very mission-driven, aligned with their values. And so I think this is another way where, you know, by adopting social accounting, firms can, you know, become more attractive to the younger generation. Um, did you have some thoughts there? And then I also, so Lisa is one of my former students, and I uh, would be thrilled to hear how her thinking has shifted, you know, as she became in, uh, familiar with these concepts. Yes, thank you. Yes, because I've been thinking about, yes, about uh, multi-generational uh, workforce environments, you know, workplace environments. We're also interfacing with different uh, executives and leaders who represent different educational groups, in addition to on another subject would be the intercultural perspective how different cultures comprehend and understand what social capital means based on where their backgrounds are and how do we implement that in the workforce when we're working with teams that represent different generations and different cultural groups. Um, that is really a, a great question. So just as an example, um, I um, when I talk to people from Europe a lot of times, they do not like this model at all because they do not like the word capital. And so when I explain to them that capital, I use it because it's a resource that endures and can create more resources. That's how, it, and it's, I found it's a term that can be heard in the United States very well. Um, but if I explain to them it's a proxy for capabilities, then they can hear that term and then they're on board with this model. Um, so I think language does make a big difference in knowing who your audience is and what they're trying to accomplish. This is a very... Well, thank you so much. I like the the proxy uh, a potential ability or capabilities. You know those, those kinds of words to to replace or to to signify the meaning of what we're talking about with capital. Well, that's one of the key differences, right? Is that uh, financial accounting really looks at past performance, and then somehow it thinks that that's going to be an indicator of future performance. But if you look, adopt this multiple capitals or multiple capabilities, that is much closer to getting at what a firm needs in order to produce sustainable value. And so, I yeah, um, I really love you know Marcia Sen and Martha Nussbaum's work on capabilities and human development. Um, I think it's another way to integrate the levels and 
and also getting to the future potentiality. And I think this, this question about terminology is important because some people have certainly suggested that so social capabilities would be a better term than social capital. But I also think that the capabilities on its, on its own, the word capabilities on its own, misses a lot of what we're talking about with social capital. And so it ends up being this sort of tricky situation where a lot of people object to capital, and I completely understand that. It doesn't sit particularly comfortably with me either. Um, but the, all of the substitute words or alternative words don't seem to carry the same kind of meaning and significance. Uh, yeah, it heartens, it heartens me to hear you that you've had these same kind of like inner conflicts about it. Um, and so I just, depending on who I'm talking to, use the phrase that resonates with them. There is no perfect word. And I, my hope is that we don't get hung up on vocabulary. I understand precision of language is important many times. In this case, I think what's more important is the shared values and goals of wanting to, you know, increase cooperation in the world for the betterment of humanity. Absolutely. And I think there are ways to describe what we mean by the term social capital in ways that communicate exactly that, that hopefully can help people to get past the ideology associated with the language. You know, there's a lot of people who say, no, I refuse to use the term social capital. I'll use social cohesion instead. Um, but surely we can move past the, the ideology of, of what specific words or phrases mean in other contexts and we can define them what they mean in this context because surely there's enough similarity between what we're talking about the cap the properties of capital we're talking about in social capital that capital is not the wrong word to use you know it, it is investable it is translatable it is it is a potential it has all of those sort of properties of capital but maybe not exactly what some people mean by capital in some sort of neoclassical economic ideology Should we well move said. on? Move on to the next question, uh, Kiyomi. I think you had a question. Did you want to unmute yourself, or would you prefer me to read it for you? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for interesting research framework. Um, social accounting is a really new idea for new field for me. Um, I think it is a quantitative analysis. That's why my question is about the, how calculate the calculation methodology. So how did you calculate by using input factors? And especially, how did you calculate the impact of social capital? Uh, did you use the input output analysis or something? Yeah, thank you. I haven't dived into the actual calculations. That's not something that I'm uh, interested in. And there's people that are much more qualified for me to do that. I mean, the key thing is that there are measures and that companies should be using these measures and they're not. Um, so right now companies are using very um, limited proxies, right? Such as, you know, employee engagement would be maybe, you know, the number of, of people that are promoted or um, for social capital, the net promoter score. Um, exam and if they went more to network analysis, for example, there are more sophisticated ways. And Kim, it sounds like you may have um, expertise in this area. So I really encourage you to, to get involved and in, um, in bring your methods to businesses. I think they are very much needed. Um, you know, the, my value add is really the and piece, the integration of these ideas so that these concepts can be made more transparent and taken up into um, people's psyche um, so that then we will start investing in social capital and human capital instead of thinking of them either not at all or as expenses. Okay, thank you. I took that out of your presentation as well, Elizabeth. It seems like you're you're not saying that this is exactly what social capital is, or this is how you go about measuring it, or or any of those kind of specific methodological issues. It's more about the bigger picture of what we mean by social capital is important within this framework and this way of understanding in the way in which value is created and organizations function. Yeah. Exactly. I think it, it, you know, it's premature to get to the measures if we don't even have that basic conceptual understanding. So that's you know, what I'm trying to plant the seeds for. Um, in, the QME, I, in the resources section, though, there, I did include a publication that has like a systematic literature review of measures for social capital, as well as some other forms of capital like cultural. Um, so maybe that would be of interest to you. And I think uh, Trista will be sending the slides out later or the link. 
we, we can certainly do that. Yeah, thank you. I'm waiting the link. And I think like the approach that I take to social capital is, is not that there's any one right, right way to conceptualize it or to measure it, that, that really all of the different approaches give us some information about what's happening in that space. Uh, I think the, the important thing to understand about the different approaches and the different ways of understanding and measuring social capital is, is probably to understand each one's limitation more than saying that one is right and one is wrong. You know, maybe there are some that are better than others, but it's it's so contextual. And I think that all of them do have value. Uh, and that's what I encourage all researchers to see and understand is that whatever approach you're taking, there is value there in, in, in understanding these kinds of processes. It, it, it is such a nascent field, right? And so doing that local contextualization to understand, you know, what does your system look like? What does social capital look like? And then over time, um, I think comparisons will become possible well, as we start being able to compare and identify commonalities, the common patterns that will lead us to more robust measures, I think. Yeah, I think so. And we're, we're continuing to improve our understanding of what it is we're actually talking about when we're talking about social capital. And I think a lot of the, the previous confusion that's existed between mixing up the sources and the form and the outcomes and not really having a clear picture about the, 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 the process of causality that exists within what we're talking about. I think a lot of those things are slowly resolving themselves over time. I mean, it's taken 30 years. One would hope it would have been a bit quicker, but these are complicated, multidimensional, complex causalities that we're talking about. So it's understandable that it takes quite a bit of time. So we, we still do have time for a few more questions. If anyone thinks of anything else you'd like to, to put into the chat or you can raise your hand. I did wanna um, talk about the uh, living standards framework here in New Zealand. Um, and get your, your input on this as well, Elizabeth. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of background for the audience. The, the New Zealand Treasury has been working on this for probably about 15 years or more. So this is across successive governments, not just the, the current Labour government, which is a centre-left type government, but also previous governments that were more right-wing as well. And so we're seeing we've seen this evolve over a long period of time. And the general idea is, is from Treasury is that there's not just one way of measuring well-being. It's not just about say GDP, but it's actually about housing and education and a variety of other things that create well-being in society. And Treasury is interested in identifying those things and to, um, to measure them basically. And so they've embraced the capitals framework as part of that. So uh, the four capitals, basically they've called it financial capital, natural capital, social capital and human capital. And so I think the interesting thing about this is the way in which uh, the, the, the national government at the, at the, at the, the whole country level uh, has then provided this framework that then filters down to government departments and in fact in, to, to businesses and organisations within the country have started to, to, to factor in and take interest in these kinds of other ways of looking at, at well-being. Um, for example, the Department of Conservation contacted me because they were really interested in measuring social capital within a um, predator reduction program that they were running. And the only reason they were interested was because they were operating under the, the Treasury's uh, living standards framework. So I think this is an example, perhaps, of the way in which government at a, at a national level can create a framework that starts to change the rules of the game a little bit and create interest um, that is, is more widespread. Excellent point, and because it's so far from happening in the United States, maybe that's why it wasn't on my radar screen, but I do think it is a very powerful um, uh, framework and, and uh, intervention, policy intervention, right? Um, the We see it incrementally here in some aspects. So for example, environmental regulations and how if a new project is going to be undertaken, it has to often have a environmental you know, uh, impact study done. The problem is that a lot of those don't have teeth. And so once they have the information, that doesn't mean that anything changes. And then they're not integrated you know, to assess with the other types of, of value, uh, such as human and social 
social um, to and cultural to see, you know, what are the potential trade-offs, right? Or synergies, the co-benefits that can be produced. And so the integrative thinking allows you to have that. So yeah, I would love to see the um, US get on board like with what New Zealand is doing. Do you know if it's still active there? Because I had talked to somebody from New Zealand who said it's it's not being taken up as much there. And I don't know why that is. Have you heard anything about that? Um, I haven't heard that. I've, I've heard that they're looking perhaps at changing the, the replacing the capitals framework, removing basically the ideology of capital and but still keeping the same general categories for for looking at well being. Um, I have certainly haven't heard that it's not being used as much. Um, the current government is very heavily invested in this and the Treasury seems to be pushing this forward and continuing with it as strongly as ever. Okay, so maybe it's just the language change. Well, then let us know what language <laughs> they come up with that we can start, you know, piggybacking on that as well. Yeah, and so I was talking with someone at Treasury a few months ago, and they were saying that they're really just dropping the word capital and maybe replacing it with a similar sort of term like capability. Uh, and I don't know where they're going to fall yet because I've, I've just looked on their website just now and they're still using the capitals terminology. So perhaps nothing's yet finalised. But um, I think the interesting thing is that the, the decision, as, as I understand it, the decision to move away from the capitals ideology was driven by an extensive community consultation process, particularly with the Māori population here in New Zealand and looking at how the wording was creating a sense of meaning um, in, in um, amongst the community. And they decided that the, the capital's ideology was too strong and to move away from that. Uh, which is interesting that it came from, from that sort of community consultation process, I think, because also in the, in the experience that I have here in the community, talking with various leaders, they they a lot of them actually like the the association with capital because it communicates something that's important and it's in the language of the dominant paradigm so i'm sure that there wasn't a a clear message of let's get rid of capital but clearly overall they decided to to remove it well that was my understanding i haven't seen it come through on their website yet okay that's super helpful thank you for that background so I think this, this could be an example of, of what other governments could do. Um, you know, we know that Bhutan, for example, has uses the, the gross, gross national happiness index rather than, than GDP as, as one of the, the ways in which they measure progress within the country. And I it would be really fascinated to see how that kind of way of thinking about progress uh, and measuring value maybe filters down to the ways in which individual government departments, individual uh, organizations and businesses operate within that country with that kind of, of um, flag being flown at the national level that says something different than what perhaps a lot of the other, other countries are prioritizing being GDP, being the kind of core measure of success. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, absolutely. So have we got any other questions, Marion, coming through in the chat? Does anyone else want to um, ask any other questions or, or any other comments? Um, other than saying thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, people, uh, I can't see any more questions coming through. Um, I've just made some suggestions um, privately to you, Tristan, about what next. So, but, yeah, I, I think... Um, no, no, no further questions. And definitely the conversation will continue after this. Right. So back to you. So I think um, the what we're doing here with these webinars and, and the Social Capital Group is we're establishing an international association. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done. And anyone who would like to contribute to that, um, please get in, in touch with either me or with Marion. Um, and we'll we'll put you in the in in touch with somebody who can organise that, and you can you can get involved. We're hoping very soon to start opening up membership, um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, it's all kind of in progress currently. So, any further questions? One final opportunity. Doesn't seem like it. So thanks very much, Elizabeth, for your time and effort in preparing this. And it was certainly a fascinating presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you all.
So next week, our next webinar will be from Professor Matthias Mimbelium Polan, who's going to be presenting about the, the three perspectives of social capital. And I've followed his work for a while and I invited him to give this webinar because I think his perspective about the ind individualistic, the communitarian and the macro social approaches to social capital can be helpful to understand the different ways in which we might understand the concept. So he's going to be giving a webinar and then we'll have a, an interesting discussion after that. So that's in, in a week from now. So I hope you can join us for that one. So the, the thanks are coming through thick and fast on the chat. Um, thanks very much. And we'll end here and look forward to seeing you next time.